Falls City, let's stand and worship this morning.
Isn't that awesome? It's so, I'm glad they chose to do that a guitar solo portion, but I'm so awkward up here. I don't have an instrument, so I'm kind of just standing there awkwardly. I'm pretty sure Tim hid my tambourine, so. I found it earlier. I'm sure you did. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Falls City. We are super excited that you, that you are here with us this morning. And if you're joining us on live stream, we're excited that you're with us in spirit. Um, please like, share, um, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all that fun stuff um, so we can spread the word. Um, we had VBS this week, and it went really well. So we want to thank Lin Lindsay Bullock, our children's pastor, for that. She does an amazing job. Yeah. So we are super excited that we have someone here um, that can do fun things like that for our children. Um, also, we've said this a couple times, we're doing financial peace. Um, it's free for anyone who's interested. So um, Quentin's talked about that a couple times. He's not here this morning, but if you're interested in that, please talk to Tim or Adam and they'll get you set up with Quentin so that um, you're able to take that. Um, obviously, COVID's still happening, so um, communion, as usual, go back and take at your own time, and offering, go back and put it in at your own time. Um, if you are new to Fall City, um, please leave us a message so we can reach out to you. You have this fun little thing right here, and you can tear off this, and you can fill out your name, and we will get in contact with you. And so we finished our Rise Up series last week, and we are starting a new series this week called The Whole Bird. So do with ah! that, yeah, do with that what you will. Um, so I think that's it. So without further ado, we're going to keep on worshiping.
God's presence, to be here with him, to know that God has a blessing for us, a blessing to give to us, a blessing for his people. In the Bible, God calls his people the remnant, those that are left over, those that are left to follow him. God wants our worship. He wants and loves us, but he has so many plans for us. He, he has a desire for our love. And as his children, he wants to bless us continually. I'll read some words that David wrote in the psalm. Just kind of listen to these and let, let this be your prayer. Let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all of my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all of us, to all who are treated unfairly. He reveals his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Our days on the earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and die. The wind blows and we're gone, as though we had never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children, of those who are faithful to his covenant, of those who obey his commandments. The Lord has made the heavens his throne from from there, he rules over everything. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. Praise the Lord, everything he has created, everything in all his kingdom. Let all that I am praise the Lord. God has so many plans and so much love for us. Not just for us, but for our generations to come, for those that follow behind us. To know the legacy that we have in Christ will continue and continue and continue if we lead in that fashion. I know for me, I had forefathers and grandfathers and grandmothers before me and a mother and a father that believed in Jesus. And now it flows through me. It's my prayer that it will continue to throw, flow through generations. And they may not know my name in a hundred years, 
but they'll know that I stood for something, something special, something everlasting, something unfailing. We enter into a time when we remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf when we eat the bread that represents the body that was broken, drink the cup that represents the blood that was poured out. When Jesus went to the cross, he died for us. For those that came before him and for those in the future. That we could have that opportunity to have everlasting life with him. So as we take this, this moment, let us remember that sacrifice. This is your time to lift him up in that special blessing.
guys can have a seat. You're going to gain my composure here. That song gets to me sometimes. Um, this is the first time I ever played it, so it got me choked up a little. <laughs> um, because of the promise to my children and their children and their children. And it just, it just kind of lines up kind of unintentionally because we're in a new series called The Whole Bird. And I know that sounds funny, but, and I've wrestled with it. Like this time last week, I had no idea what I was going to speak about because there's so much going on in this world right now. There's so much that's threatening my family and my children and their children and their children. And so it was about the middle of the week before I even knew what I was going to call the series, before I even knew uh, how we were going to unpack it. And then all of a sudden, this song comes through. I'd never heard it before in my life. Listen to it, I think, I don't know, Friday morning, then one more time again this morning. <laughs> and uh, it just it just rings loud and clear with a promise. And it kind of, kind of solidified the things that I want to talk about, which is, which is hard. And it's scary for me because in, in the current social climate, I feel, sorry about that, I'm trying to, I feel that it's, uh, it's important to address some of the things that are going on. There are a lot of, a lot of churches that would just prefer to steer clear of that, right? And it's probably going to get, um, it probably isn't going to get easy. It, it's a situation where a lot of churches want to use their walls as a bunker to keep, to keep all that crap out, right? But as the church, I feel that we need to be more like a hospital than a bunker, right? So that people can, so that people can come and, and people can, can be in the midst of their hurt and their mess and their questions and the issues and, and the problems that are going on. And then we utilize this moment to introduce them to Jesus. Because ultimately, no matter what's going on in this world, they need Jesus. And if they don't have him, it doesn't matter what's going on in this world. Because it's all for nothing anyways. And this, this is going to be messy, y'all. And it's probably going to rub some people the wrong way. All right? But who are we if we can't, hard, if we can't have hard conversations? I think that we are a church that, that purposefully, that we are not afraid of the mess. And, and I'll let you know up front, and anybody who really knows me, they know I'm not really a political person. They know um, by nature I'm more of an observer in a lot of ways. And, and I know that everyone has their opinion, and I have mine. But this isn't my platform for my opinion, all right? This is me looking at the Word of God and staring into the face of Jesus and, 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 and seeing what a future could possibly be out of this, all right? So it's not about my opinion. This series is about, about searching for some, some clarity. Could any of us use clarity? Yeah? Look, at some of you are mean mugging already. I haven't even started, and you, and you all already ticked off. I love it. This is going to be fun. I'm scared to death. <laughs> um, we're, we're searching for clarity. And, 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 and as a church, we want to know what's right. And, and not only do we want to know what's right, but we want to know what's useful, right? Because there are a lot of things that, that seem right, but they're not useful to the world around us. And so we're going to dive into this. And when I say right and useful, I mean a, a good way to move forward with the best opportunity for everyone involved. And I can just say, all we need is Jesus and drop the mic right now. But there are some more things that I want us to, I want us to dive into and look at and think about, all right? Different people have differing opinions on this, okay? With, with things being so socially and emotionally charged right now, I want us to, to look at how we can be useful in this situation. I want us to see how we could possibly be useful. Not just right, not just the loudest, not just the neatest or the cleanest or the most sterile, 
or, or, or with, the, with the biggest attendance, right? But how we can be useful in this situation. And so this week we're going to address something uh, that, that's going to be the lens by which we look at the rest of the sermons in this series. Okay? This series is the prep work. In the next weeks, we're going to get into politics. I know, right? <laughs> in the next weeks, we're going to get into racism. I know, right? In, in, in the next weeks, we're going to get into humanity in general and snowflakes and bullies and squeaky wheels, right? And I know that all sounds scary, but I want today to be the lens by which we kind of view those from. This is one of the, the biggest roadblocks to progress through most anything we will see in our, our society today. And it's simply the polarity of our nation. It's how polarized we are. It is how far apart we are on absolutely freaking everything. And you're either way over here or you're way over there and there is no middle, right? The polarity of our nation is a problem. And if the church is taking part in that polarity, then they are not being the church that they were called to be. Intense enough for you yet? Because it's about to get crazier. And, and, and a lot of things we see going on in the world right now, there are typically two sides, right? And those two sides are polar opposites. Those, those opposite sides are normally extremely left or extremely right with a, with a giant chasm in between them, with, with a huge space in between them. The, the, the chasm is very spacious, but rather than filling in that chasm, we tend to see more people yelling across the chasm in order to be heard. As opposed to step closer to each other and initiating a conversation for the sake of understanding and clarity. Would you agree with that? Two of you? One of you? So to any social or political issue, it's typically extremely easy. A lot of times the flick of a remote control to find the left wing and the right wing. And I'm gonna go ahead and preface this. I'm gonna say right wing and left wing a lot and I'm gonna mess those up and it's gonna sound funny because right, you say right wing five times fast and well, you sound like an idiot. So um, each of those wings tend to be fighting for the power and the louder voice in an issue, right? It appears that, that these wings actually hate each other and would prefer for the other wing to just be gone. Would prefer for the other wing to just, to just be amputated. I just pulled my pants up. I feel like a Matt Foley, motivational speaker. Um, but, but the thing about it is, is they would, they would prefer for the other wing to just be gone. So they can do what they want. And the problem with that is that when one is amputated or silenced, maybe that's the amputation of, of today, we're stuck with a one-winged bird. A one-winged bird. And what does that do? What does it do, right? A one-winged bird. You're preaching my sermon already, bro. <laughs> so, so I want to talk about this problem. Because, because I feel that we need to refocus a bit in order to bring real progress to the issue. And the answers uh, to, to, to not land completely, totally on one wing or the other. Because if we amputate one wing then we find ourselves in trouble. It's the, it's the kind of division that is, that is killing our nation and hurting our people, right? And, and, and if this kind of polarity continues, we won't survive and there will, be no, there will be no promise from at least this nation for our children and their children and their children. There will be survival and pain. The only promise that they will find is the promise that God gives them. <laughs> but... I want my kids to have a great life. I go out of my way to make sure my kids have a life that I didn't have. 
And so there's a little bit that's selfish inside of me that says, let's get our crap together so my kids can have a good life, right? It's that kind of division that's killing the opportunity and the hope for our children and their children. Jesus is talking to these religious leaders and he says this, um, he says, but the, but the teachers of religious law who, who had arrived from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Satan. So the religious leaders were accusing Jesus of being possessed by Satan. Excuse me. <clears throat> I promise that wasn't a COVID cough, okay? Uh, he's possessed by Satan, the, the prince of demons, that's where he gets the power to cast out demons. And Jesus called him over and responded with an illustration. He says, how can Satan cast out Satan? He asked. A kingdom divided, and when you listen to this, a kingdom, a nation divided by civil war will what? Collapse. Now through history, we've seen nations rise and fall and it is typically become because of this, right? Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if, and if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. These are the words of Jesus about division, about polarity, right? The religious leaders are accusing Jesus of being possessed by the devil, but he's been casting out demons which doesn't make sense, right? So he says, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. If I am the devil, why would I cast out demons? Why would I fight against myself? And because of that statement, we are all now a little dumber. You are awarded no points and may God have mercy on your soul. Anybody know what movie that's from? Nice. We can be friends. Everybody else, we're not friends. Okay? Okay. He says, he says, what you are saying here would mean that Satan would have to be divided against himself and that kills the progress of even his goals and his purposes. That makes no sense even if you are the baddest of the bad. He goes on uh, to say that the kingdom, the kingdom divided against itself will collapse and that feels too possible right now. That might be intense and I may be a little dramatic, but I freaking love my kids and I want them to have a good life. So let's dive in and, and, and adjust the lens by which we're viewing the issues of our world today. Can we do that? And so my first point is, a one-winged bird is a broken bird. If it's one-winged, it's broken. Okay? Let, let, let's say you're on a walk on on um, the riverfront or you're on, uh, what's, what's the trail that goes up the hill? The Heritage Trail. See, this is already a story because I would never do that. I would die before I got to the top of that hill and my knees would break off before I got to the bottom of it. So either way, it's already a story. But, but let's say you, you're walking up the Heritage Trail and you, you stumble upon a bird and you realize that it's missing a wing. What's your first thought? Oh, <laughs> poor little guy. Mine would be like, what happened? Right? Like something had to have happened for this bird to be in the state that it's in, right? Something had to have broken. My second would be, hungry little fella. <laughs> Anybody know what that one's from? Ace Ventura. Watch it. I know. We, not, now none of us can be friends. I, I automatically assume that, that, that something traumatic has happened to this bird, and that's why it's broken. I would, I would worry because it would be in pain, and it would be um, susceptible to being picked off by larger animals. Right? I know that sounds gross and mean, but essentially it's a sitting duck. All pun intended. Okay. <laughs> the, but, but the little guy is extremely limited in, his, in, in what he's able to do to survive, to progress, right? He's not able to survive or, or, or live a full life because, because there is something broken about this bird. It's got one wing, and I'd, lo I'd love to, I love the end of this passage that we're getting into um, 
that we're about to read. It's in John chapter 1. And anybody who, who uh, knows John chapter 1, they know that, that this is a picture painted by John of the coming of the Messiah, of the coming of Jesus. And, and the way he paints this, I think, is just, just beautiful. It's beautiful. And so we jump into this, and he says, excuse me, that was a worship burp. Um, and he says, and, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's already cool, right? He made his home among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the Son, as only the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him. He's talking about John the Baptist here. John the Baptist bore uh, witness about him and cried out, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. That, see, that already gave me cold chills. But I want you to listen to this part. This part is the part I want to drive home here. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law, I want you to listen to this. For the law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, right? Jesus comes, and what does he bring with him? I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with grace and truth. Grace and truth. Very good. Very good. Notice that this passage doesn't say Jesus comes and he brings with him grace or truth. It's grace and truth, right? He doesn't say grace or truth. It's actually both, not one or the other. I believe that they both need each other to actually be what they are. Grace needs truth and truth needs grace in order to completely be truth or completely be grace. Think about this. What is truth without grace? I say the same thing about love. What is truth without love? But grace is simply a byproduct of love, right? Anybody, any guesses? It's fact. There's a, there's a difference between fact and truth. I know that sounds weird, but, but truth and facts are not the same thing. Facts are true, okay? But truth brings more to the table than just facts, all right? There is, there is depth to truth. There is journey in truth. There is love and grace there. You don't always get that with just facts, right? How, how much passion, how much love, how much grace, how much journey do you feel whenever I say two plus two is four? Probably not a lot, right? That's a fact. That's a math fact. And it is true. But I don't know that it crosses the line to like this deep gut truth, right? This heart truth. It, it's, it's, like, it's like facts are, are lifeless. They have like no soul. They're just facts, right? But, but truth breathes, breathes life into facts. You can, you can absolutely have facts without grace. But truth requires a different set of tools. It requires some soul. It requires some depth. It requires love and grace, right? And you absolutely cannot have grace without truth. You can't have grace without truth. Because, because if there wasn't truth, what are we contrasting against to know that we're in need of grace? Like if there's no truth, how do we know that we're bad enough to need grace? Right? How do we know that we need grace? If there's no truth to show us our error, then how do we know we need grace? So not only did Jesus come with both, right? But both complemented one another. And the thing about it is, is, is even in the church world, we've turned those two into enemies. You have your liberal churches, who wear skinny jeans and play loud music, right? You have, your, you have your, your conservative churches who wear ties and play the organ or the piano. Or maybe you go to hell if you 
play either one of them. I don't know, right? But we've turned grace and truth into enemies, right? We've turned it into grace or truth, and, and now you're on team truth or team grace. Except when they are pitted against one another, they are more like team fact and team free-for-all, right? Right? It's not team grace or truth because those have to be together to complement one another. And both of those teams are dangerous. Both teams alone are dangerous. It's scary to think about, about the things that have unpacked through the religious world because we've taken the both and and turned them into either ors. So, so we as Christ followers take notes from Jesus and, and we bring not just the left wing or not just the right wing to the table, but we bring the whole bird to the table the, because the whole bird requires so much more of us than just one or the other, right? This requires work, which we're not typically in favor of. It requires humility, which is another thing that we're not quite in favor of, right? It requires truth and grace, not truth or grace, right? And this begins a conversation, I believe. A conversation, not a yelling match, but a conversation. Which brings me to my second point. A one-winged bird flies in circles, right? It just flies in circles or it just flops around on the ground which I'm sure is super awkward, right? <laughs> it's, not, it's not graceful at all. It just flies in circles. So let's say uh, this, this, this uh, bird has one wing missing and the bird miraculously takes flight. Where's that bird going? <laughs> yeah, or nowhere in circles, right? Right? What kind, what, kind of, what kind of effort does that take to get into the air with one wing, right? And... What's the point? <laughs> right? What, what's the point? Where are you going? Little buddy? Where are you going, little buddy? You're just flying in circles. Right? It doesn't really go anywhere. It kind of just flops around violently and it just flies in circles. And its, and its only goal was to fly. Essentially, to get above where it was. To be louder than the other. Right? And, and now that it's off the ground... The only thing it does is constantly revisits where it has been. Right? Constantly revisits where it has been. It gets going and it feels like it's making progress. But all of a sudden they're like, I, I've, I've seen this before. Right? I, I, it's deja vu all over again. And, and, and it constantly goes where it's been over and over and over again. There's no progress for this bird. Just energy and effort spent. That's it. And to what end? Imagine, Jesus has spent the last three years teaching this, this group of guys, loving them, nurturing them, feeding them, correcting them. And he's teaching them to change the world, to be the change that the world needs. All right? And then he dies, he's buried. He resurrects, he's, he's about to leave for heaven, and this is what he says to his disciples, all right? He says, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, I want, I want to stop there for a second. All authority in heaven and on earth, that means at this moment, he is the most powerful being in all of creation, Okay? The most powerful being in all of creation. Not just on earth, but in the universes. Not just universe, but universes. I think that's plural for universe. Universe I? Right? Um, so he, he's at his most powerful and he says this. Therefore, go. Go and make disciples of all the nations all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. All right? There's truth. 
right? And be sure of this. I am with you always. There's grace. Because could I go through this? Could I go through the things that I've gone through in my life if I didn't have Jesus with me always? Uh-uh. Even to the end of the age. That means forever. So, so at, at, at the, the pinnacle of his power, he says to his boys, go, go somewhere, make progress. Forward motion is a must. Don't just fly in circles and revisit everything that we've seen because I'm not gonna be around to, to, to save your butt when you're walking on water and you sink. I will be here, but I'm not gonna be here in that fashion, in that way. So go. Don't sit and talk and yell and debate and politicize. Go. Think about it. Up, in, uh, up until... Up until the point of the day of Pentecost and the, miss, the missionary journeys of, of the Apostle Paul and some of the other apostles, the gospel was fairly local. It was, it was more of a regional thing, a national thing, right? It, it could only be obtained in its, in its fullness by the Jews. It wasn't until later that the Gentiles and the rest of the world w had their opportunity and their taste of salvation. So Jesus tells them to go, to move forward. Can, can you imagine if they had just sat and, and, and fought about what the best route to Asia Minor was? Well, no, I think through the mountains would be better. It's shorter. I know there's elevation issues, and then they just sit and fight about, or I think we should go around, or maybe we should take the scenic route and catch us some, some ocean time so we can have a, a little layover at the beach and hang out and chill and rest, because God said Sabbath is important, right? Imagine if they spent all their time fighting about how to get to Asia Minor. There'd be an entire nation of people who missed out on the gospel, the good news, the fact that Jesus came died, was buried, resurrected, defeated sin, hell, and death, and now we have a taste of salvation. And don't get me wrong, there were disagreements. There were, there were arguments amongst the apostles. But when push came to shove, the real leaders made sure to advance the message of the gospel. They made sure that progress was made. Jesus commanded them to advance the good news, not to fight over who was the one in charge. No, not hold debates or, or spend resources on feasibility studies on which version of the gospel is the best version of the gospel. The best version of the gospel is the real one. And the real one has both truth and grace, not just one or the other. And, and when it is grace or truth, you have two different versions of the gospel and both of them are wrong. So you have two birds that are wrong. Two birds that are going nowhere now. You got one with just the left wing and one with just the right wing. Sounds like an order at KFC. Um, they're getting nowhere and they're both flying in circles. Which leads me to my final point. When birds circle, that typically means that something is dead, dying, or rotten. Right? So when you see a bunch of buzzards flying in circles, what do you typically think? Oh, no. <laughs> right? What, what do you typically think? Yeah, something is dead or they know it's about to die. So they're circling so they can swoop in. I don't know if you guys know this, but um, I'm a Jeep man. I drive a Jeep because I'm a stud, right? You know what Jeep stands for? <laughs> Just empty every pocket because something's always wrong with that stupid thing, right? Right now, um, it's warm, it's nice. I have the doors and the top off and, and it's cool to go cruising and creaking. It is amazing, right? 
You can kind of feel all the feels and you can, uh, you, you can feel the sun on your skin and the wind blowing. You drive down a little dip or, or a valley and you can feel the temperature change. It's really, really nice. Another thing that you get with a Jeep is that you can also smell all the smells. Farms are just a little more farmy, <laughs> you know? when you don't have doors. Skunks are just a little more skunky <laughs> when, when you don't have doors. Uh, I always hate whenever I'm driving in my Jeep and the doors are off and the top's off and I see a buzzard in the middle of the road because that means they are eating something that has been hit. A little rabbit, raccoon, possum, perhaps a moose. Oh, there's no moose here. Anyways, um, which means it's going to smell. It is. It's going to stink. I'm going to smell the smells of that raccoon that's been baking on the road for a day or two. All right? You smell the smells. It's gross. The, buzz, the buzzards, they tear that carcass apart and, and they spread it all around the road. They gain nourishment from the demise of others. That's like what a buzzard does. They see peril as an opportunity to fill their stomachs and take full advantage of it. Heck, they will risk being hit by oncoming traffic for just one more bite. How many of you guys have ever hit a buzzard or narrowly missed a buzzard because they just wanted one more bite because they're selfish, right? Jesus um, addresses some of these buzzards or vultures in Matthew chapter 23. It says, it says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. For, for you're like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. You're rotten, right? Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but in, inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Ultimately, you're not even standing for what it is that you're supposed to be standing for. Now, the religious leaders were about one thing. Do we know what that was? The law, right? That's what they were about. They were about the law, but they also leveraged that law to make sure that their stomachs stayed full like vultures, like buzzards, right? To the point that they even killed the son of God. They hung him on a cross and murdered him. That was their, their proverbial last bite before the takeoff, right? The, the law, it came from Moses, which was, which was given to Moses by God in the form of how many commandments? 10 commandments, right? The religious leaders had, had managed to pervert the law so much that they had over 600 more laws and amendments that made things virtually impossible for everybody. Nobody could win this game. This gave them power, and this, this, this filled their pockets. The more sin, the more sin offerings. The more sin offerings, the more money. The more money, the more power. So Jesus says, you guys are dead on the inside. You feed off the peril of others. Essentially, you're vultures who are waiting for people to screw up. You're just circling, right? Right? so you can get more money and more power. Outwardly, you look righteous, but inwardly, you're rotten. You're dead. They were not about truth and grace. They were about fact. Fact is, we're the ones in charge, right? And Jesus tells them that it's all disgusting, what they're doing. It's disgusting. But before I wrap this up, we also need to understand that, that Jesus, in spite of their, their inward decay, in, in spite of, of how disgusting they were, he still offered them the same thing he came packing with, grace and truth. The truth was that he was going to die for them 
And they, through him, even though they were terrible people, had the opportunity to be saved. That was the truth, all right? That's also fact, <laughs> but that was the truth. And the grace part was they deserved to rot. They did, they deserved to rot. But Jesus died for them anyways. I deserve to rot, but Jesus died for me anyways. And, and he gave them the same opportunity that we have to have life eternal. So how do we lean in? How do we squeeze in and make room for both? How do we squeeze in and make room for truth and grace? How do we squeeze in and make room for right and left? Because I think that's where you get both. That's where you get the and, the both and, not the either or. Because it is my belief that if you are only right, then you're wrong. And it's also my belief that if you are only left, then you're not right. I mean, seriously. Because the only way that we will be able to move forward, to progress, the only way that we can honor this great commission where Jesus at the pinnacle of his power says, go, is if it means that we stop villainizing the other wing. And we begin progressive conversations. Jesus brought both and, not either or. In church, as long as I'm the pastor here, as long as I'm the lead pastor, that's what we need to bring to the table. And if we're not gonna do that, then I don't need to be your pastor. If we're not gonna do that, then I don't wanna be your pastor. Because I'm interested in progress, not the volume of my voice, and not the power that comes with being right. And we as a church need to be interested in those same things. So we bring to the table both and, not either or. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the fact that, that you brought grace and truth. Not just one or the other. Not just rules that, that we can't possibly live up to, and not just chaos, not just a free-for-all. Father, I thank you for the fact that, that you've given us community, you've given us relationship, you've given us hope and peace and grace and the opportunity to have progressive conversations, and you've given us the command to go. Father, help us to be like you. Help us to bring truth and grace. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand, let's worship.
Every fear, there's an empty grave.